Fantasy Ed with Jonathan Chan, Kevin Quo, Richard Seville. Hello and welcome to the Fantasy Edge. I am Richard Seville of FantasySixPack.net and joining me shortly will be Jonathan Chan, also of FantasySixPack.net. Bringing you all the uh, weekend, uh, sort of a weekend recap and uh, the Bears and uh, Redskins game is going on as we speak. And once again, it's for two Monday nights in a row. It's, it's not the greatest football game in the world, but I can tell you that uh, Taylor Gabriel is lighting it up for the Bears. Apparently, he continues to be one of uh, Mitch Trubisky's favorite targets, and no, sadly, Anthony Miller is no doesn't seem to be any part of this offense. I think he had one catch, as what I'd seen. Anyways, I'd like to introduce my co-host. Kevin Ho is off tonight. He uh, he has a lot of extra school work to do today, so it's just Jono and me. Uh, this week. Jono, how are you doing, my man? Uh, doing a little bit of baseball, some Jays Prospects uh, uh, baseball all-star game. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so that was my week. I spent last week at the Rogers Center, downtown Toronto, commentating and writing about the Blue Jays uh, T12 tournament. So they take the top 150 prospects from around the country. Uh, they bring them together and they play in, in front of pro amateur scouts trying to show what they got. And a Three of the three alumni from the tournament have made the major leagues. Uh, Atlanta Braves, Mike Soroka, Houston Astros, Abraham Toro, and the San Diego Padres, Josh Naylor, were all part of this tournament uh, when they started. And there's a few players coming up that are looking uh, looking pretty promising. Oh, that, that sounds pretty interesting. In the, in the Rogers Center, did you, uh, from your own scouting eyes, did any uh, players um, stand out in, if, in, in this particular game? Yeah, there are a couple of players I'd uh, look out for. Connor O'Halloran, um, he's a pitcher. Uh, he's committed to Michigan right now. Uh, son of a former major leaguer. He looked really good. Uh, the, the, the most dominant pitcher there. And uh, and uh, outfielder Owen Casey. The entire tournament, he was, uh, again, just dominant. He had power, speed. He won the home run derby. Uh, the prospect home run derby. He's the only person to reach double digits. And uh, he, he looked good. He looked good. Oh, okay, awesome. Right. Well, we're a football show, so we're going to talk about NFL football and fantasy NFL football, of course. I can do that, too. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. We can walk and chew gum at the same time, I know. Um, but uh, in this particular game, uh, Chicago leads 28-15, to 15, and the Bears are, are dominating on Dolph. Well, at least they did in the first half. They're starting to wear down a little bit, but... Uh, it seems like the Bears are mostly in control. The uh, Mitch Trubisky threw a, an interception uh, late in the third quarter, which uh, snuffed out uh, a pretty good-looking drive, one of the few uh, drives that uh, um, that I've seen Trubisky actually run to almost completion, but then he throws an interception, and uh, that seems to be the end of that. Although his numbers uh, in fantasy are a little bit better than uh, what they've been in the first two weeks. At least he's getting over 10 point fantasy points. So he's close to 20. So he's doing a little bit better. For currently uh, 14th overall for the week. So uh, things are looking up ahead of a few uh, important names like um, Jared Goff and Andy Dalton. He's ahead of them. Head of Kyler Murray. Kyler Murray not not didn't do so good this week but uh, we'll uh, get into all that in just a moment but first we'll uh, talk about the news shall we Jono yeah let's get started all right let's uh, first of all I guess we should talk about uh, uh, let's get this out of the way um, Antonio Brown out of football um, I got a lot of uh, people on Twitter who are very upset about this Antonio Brown was a bit of a risk to draft, and now this player is gone, and, and and a lot of people spent. I don't know about you, did I, I? He went around sometimes second or third round in the drafts in August. Would you say, John? Yeah, he was going in the second round um, before all the the first bit, the first incidents came. Yeah. And then he started dropping and dropping. I think by the end of the helmet saga, he was like end of the fourth. I believe that that's where he was. Now that's still pretty high pick. Yeah. Right. And so people are losing a losing a player. When you, I think it hurts more that you're losing a player like that. It's really turned people off lead fantasy. 
this sort of thing because people feel like they kind of got they got cheated because they didn't know because a lot of people don't follow the news like we do. But Antonio Brown out of football, um, he lashed out on Twitter at Ben Roethlisberger's situation when he was when he was involved in some sort of problems, and uh, he was lashing out at. Uh, one of the uh, commentators, uh, Sterling Shepard, I believe, and and there's just no. I think there's really something wrong with him. I mean, I wish him the best now. Well, I I do and I don't. I think he's just become an annoyance, and I'm gl- I'm kind of glad he's out of football. It might help him just take a take some time off and work his way back. And in, in, in the sense, in the way of Josh Gordon, that is, if this his own allegations don't cross him up. So I don't know what your thoughts are about Antonio Brown. I think we've seen the last of him. In the NFL, probably. I mean, he went on Twitter and went at Robert Kraft um, for the whole incident in the Miami thing. And immediately after you get released, going after the guy that gave you that chance, after you worked your way out of Oakland and $30 million guaranteed, it's not a good look. Um, I don't really see an NFL team taking a shot at, uh, on him this year, at the very least. Um maybe Washington, but um, no, this year I think he's he's done. And unless he can really prove for a whole offseason that he can not, you know, run his mouth on Twitter, then nobody's going to take the chance on him. There was a massive hit he took from uh, Vontes Perfect some some time ago, and a lot of people think that maybe affected him. Do you think that, do you think there's any weight on that or... I mean, there it's an idea, but there's nothing that we, that anybody can prove, right? You can't, just say you can't say for sure that hey, this is what kind of set him off. Maybe you know, maybe he just he this was always him, and he just you know he made enough money, and he decided that this is what he wanted to be, or this is who he wanted to be. You know, there's nothing you can quantifiably say. Hey, perfect hit him, and it made him crazy. It's more. Anyways, we shall end that topic and move on to the current situation. And uh, this weekend. Uh, we, we kind of knew there was something wrong with Cam Newton. Um, and Kyle, Kyle Allen stepped in and uh, created, well, nobody's saying it right now, but um, I don't think anybody wants Cam to come back too soon until he's really ready because Kyle Allen um, really played well. Granted, of course, it was against the Arizona Cardinals, and he got 19 of 26 passes for two 261 yards and four touchdowns. So, uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts on Cam? And do uh, you think he should stay out a little longer until he's really ready to come back? you think they should rush him back? or or uh, Rush him back for what? I mean, Kyle Allen's already showed that he's better than, uh, you know, a healthy Kyle Allen is better <clears throat> than a hurt Cam Newton. So, there's absolutely no reason to rush Cam back. He looked terrible in his first two games. Um, Curtis Samuel and DJ Moore could be both you know, top 15 receivers if Cam could actually hit them in stride because there are a lot of open plays, especially in week two where both Moore and Samuel lost on touchdowns because Cam just airmailed a pass or threw it behind them or, you know, couldn't hit them in stride. And it's actually kind of sad to watch. Hopefully it takes a couple weeks off, gets healthy and can come back and be, you know, the, the Cam that we know. Yeah, I am i don't think they should rush Cam back. I think they, I think they could... Uh, Give Cam a little extra time, so it's. Uh, I know he says he's supposed to be practicing on Wednesday. Uh, well, I, they've already ruled him out for next week. They have. Uh, ha- they have, have yeah. they? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, then that's good. Maybe even keep him on an extra. Week. I'm only saying that because in the uh, Scotch Fish Bowl, <laughs> I picked up Kyle Allen uh, um, on spec. Actually, I picked him up on spec. I didn't have to pay for him, and uh, because I, I kind of had a feeling. Cam wasn't right after week one, so um, after week two, before before the week two waivers, or the, uh, pardon me, before waivers uh, for week three, I picked up Kyle Allen, so he's on my team, so uh, I would like to use him for a couple more weeks, because <laughs> he looked good. Out. Yeah, because he looked good. Uh, he looked good. Um, injury, the big injury this weekend, Saquon Barkley. Um didn't look too bad. I mean, he hobbled over to congratulate Daniel Jones. Did you see that? He was, you know, he's getting, <laughs> he's going as fast as his, as his, because uh, he, he was in the walking boot with with crutches, and he's just hoppling, hoppling across the uh, the field to congratulate Daniel Jones on a 
on his first uh, victory. It's quite amazing, actually. We'll get to that in a bit. But Saquon Barkley uh, out for six to eight weeks, uh, probably more. Um, thoughts on this uh, injury, John? Oh, quite unfortunate. Uh, I mean, the injury, it's, it's devastating. Uh, it's going to change the landscape of fantasy leagues, right? If you have first overall and you lose Saquon Barkley, what now? Your next player is, what, 20, 24th, 25th overall? That's, yeah. Unless you're, you're the late stages of your draft were great, you're you're probably going to be in some trouble now. Yeah, that's one of the uh, – that's the downside of having early draft pick, uh, of having the first round – like the first three draft picks. Um, you really got to wait a long time for – your next, your next pick, because you got the best player in the league. Uh, I never like having the first pick because if you lose that first pick, it is huge. And that was another thing people were griping about too. <laughs> I'm quitting fantasy football. So people get r- really upset about it. And it's not, it's not the first time it's happened. Uh, I think uh, we, we've had top players get get injured and removed before, like several times anyways uh yeah six to eight weeks uh obviously the pickup is uh wayne gallman uh what's your thoughts on him jono uh i mean gallman's not a spectacular talent by any stretch of the imagination um but what he would what he will have in favor of him is a reinvigorated giants offense and volume um after saquon went out Goldman had all the backfield touches, uh, didn't do a whole lot with them. I think he had 13 yards and five carries, but he's going to get the volume. And he has the Redskins next week. Uh, and then they've given up the second most rushing yards just next to Miami, which I don't know if I want to count Miami or not. But hey, uh, it's an opportunity. And he obviously is a priority ad this week. Mm, I'll have to check. Uh, I'm sorry, people. I don't know who the Giants have on their practice squad, who they'll be calling up. Because usually they go to their practice squad first. Uh, do you happen to know uh, if they've got an RB on the practice squad? Not off the top of my head. No, I don't know either. But they will be picking somebody up. Uh, the uh, the only other running back the Giants have is Elijah Penny. And uh, no word on who they have on their practice squad. But they will get somebody. Okay, let's take a look at the top performers this week. Uh, obviously, the number two quarterback this week, Daniel Jones. You gotta be a football hero to get along with a beautiful girl. You gotta be a touchdown getter, you bet. If you wanna. Get uh, 23 of 36, 361 yards, two touchdowns. Uh, <clears throat> four carries for 28 yards. And two touchdowns. Fantasy beast on his first outing, Jono. Yeah, I mean, he obviously blew everybody's expectations out of the water. Um, it was, he, because he was kind of a running joke all throughout the offseason. And even on our show last week, we kind of panned the decision, saying he had no weapons to go to. But he looked very, very good. And I, he's, his ownership uh, numbers are going to skyrocket as well. Everybody that had Cam or Breeze or Big Ben, they're just going to be rushing out, and they're going to be adding Daniel Jones. Yeah, he looked good. And I I even noticed in the preseason that uh, he had poise. He was smooth. C- kind of surprised me, really. I mean, he was finding, like, uh, Cody Latimer. He was, like, landing passes just perfectly on the money. He was – and his first drive, he was uh, – his first drive in preseason was absolutely perfect. Textbook. And I thought, yeah, gee, this guy is, uh, this guy's pretty calm in the pocket, almost too calm. And he still has this problem of being too, um, uh, relaxed. He's too relaxed. He's, cause he, he, lo- he forgets himself and he, and he leaves the football a little bit, um, in a precarious way where, where a defender can knock it out of his hand because he's so calm and relaxed. So he's got to kind of remember a little bit about ball security. Uh, as a quarterback, but if that's the the worst problem he's got, um, <laughs> that's something that can be coached out. So, other than that, I really think Daniel Jones he deserved the win. I was really when the uh, when the Buccaneers were lining up for the for the field goal, I was I was hoping miss 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 because <laughs> I really wanted him to win because that final drive, you know, because he said he saw green grass all in front of him. He went in. <clears throat> Another thing about Daniel Jones that I kind of like too is that uh, he's a battler. I mean, he says like like he kind of rallied the rallied his team around him and says, "Come on, we can go get this done. We can we can we can win this." 
And uh, he took the bull by the horns. And uh, that's something Eli hadn't been doing for quite a long time. Eli's that kind of quarterback too, but Eli kind of has lost a bit of that um, motivation to to really let's 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 go in. It's kind of like Eli's kind of been on the on the on the downside of of being like two touchdowns behind, and then he sort of just goes through the motions. Well, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But Daniel Jones really wanted to win his first game, and uh, and he saw he says I saw green grass in front of me, and I just went for it, and he did, and he scored the touchdown. It was a perfect, uh, perfect cap. Very happy for Giants fans. They've waited a long time. Who you got, uh, John, out of the top um, performer? Well, not my top performer, I guess I want to talk about is Alvin Kamara. Uh, a lot of people were hitting the panic button when Breeze got hurt, saying, you know, Kamara's value is going to tank. Uh, you know, everybody can key on him, key in on him now. And uh, boy, were they wrong. Kamara was the, you know, the number two running back uh, this week, you know, behind former teammate Mark Ingram. Uh, who scored three touchdowns. But uh, Kamara yeah. had 69 rushing yards and a touchdown, uh, 10 targets, caught 90, you know, nine passes for 92 yards and another touchdown. Um, no ill effects. And he had the highest snap count of his career uh, this week. Lito was up at 80, 88%. A high snap rate of his entire career. Uh, they're going to lean on him. And I guess, like we said last week, the efficiency may go down, but the volume uh, is going to go way, way up. And Kamara's still as valuable as ever, if not more. I saw him make make some really excellent moves against the Seahawks defense. Uh, he was he was making Seahawks defenders uh, miss, and that's not easy. Seahawks have a pretty pretty stout defense, and uh, he was making uh, guys miss. Uh, the one concern I think when we're talking about Alvin Kamara is, of course, Latavius Murray. Um, yeah, he he's kind of losing out. He's turned into basically just a cuff, John. Yeah, he he. I I don't think anybody ever thought that Latavius Murray was going to step right into that Mark Ingram role uh, and be as successful as he was. Um, but yeah, they're they're phasing him out. I don't think um, Latavius Murray has the kind of talent to be able to say, "Hey, let me step in with you know Teddy Bridgewater at QB and I can produce the same way I was." Um, but Kamara is that kind of guy, so I think they're going to lean on Kamara and they they need the wins. Yeah. Uh, speaking of, of leaning on um, the running game. Uh, and this kind of ties in with Dalvin Cook, is Adam Thielen finally got a uh, a decent uh, fantasy line, and Stefan Diggs is still waiting for something to happen. But Kirk Cousins, um, and before, after the first two weeks, Kirk Cousins was the 32nd quarterback for pass attempts. Could you, do you believe it? He was the, the he was actually the bottom. I mean, he didn't have to pass for the first week. I think he had about ten pass attempts in week one, so that's automatically going to skew skew everything. Yeah. But yeah. But the less you pass, the less there is for guys like Adam Thielen and and uh, Stefan Diggs is really feeling it. The fact that oh, Kirk sure. Cousin Kirk Cousins isn't throwing enough, but Adam Thielen finally got something, and he made use of his uh, only three receptions, fifty five yards, but he got a touchdown. Uh, that was enough to. Uh, Put him at number eight wide receiver for the week. Uh, that'll be number nine because Taylor Gabriel zipped up to uh, number three and he's left the game. And uh, um, as it's just been reported, so for for some kind of injury, but a uh, big day for, for uh, Taylor Gabriel tonight against the Redskins. Um, yeah, Adam, th- yeah, th- this, yeah, Jono, this, um, you think the pass attempts will go up, or do you, th- do you th- or do you think it's just let's let's uh, let's just play the run and and try to win? But I but I don't know. It I don't, doesn't seem to be a complete strategy because the obvious thing for the Minnesota Vikings they want to win, and although Dalvin Cook has been running well, he ran well against Green Bay, and in the first game, you know, of course, he was a monster. Did you say only ten pass attempts in that one. Um, for Minnesota to win, they're going to have to open up the passing game a little bit more. I mean, Kirk. Cous- I mean, if they want to be competitive, Kirk Cousins has to be a little higher than the thirty-second uh, in in pass attempts. Yeah, I mean, whatever works for them, right? They're they're playing well, and if it works, it works. Doesn't you know? They'll they'll change it up, but right. Well, I suppose they will, but I, but I want them to change it up because, uh, well, I, I want to. <laughs> I want Diggs and Thielen to get more involved. I mean, this is the first week that, you know, I could sort of hang my hat on, on Adam Thielen a little bit. 
So this is, and you know, that really isn't a, uh, a very fantastic line, three receptions, 55 yards and a touchdown, but it's enough to keep, you know, your, your, your fantasy, you know, your fantasy little life going with, uh, with Adam Thielen, but, uh, Stefan Diggs, not looking good, not looking good right now at all until that changes. So there's hope yet, folks. Hang on to, don't give up on Stefan Diggs. Uh, well, you're not giving up on Stefan Diggs, are you, Jono? No, it's hard to give up on the guy, but he has not been good. We can, we can say that he has not, uh, not lived up to expectations. Yeah, he is getting the targets. Uh, I have to say he is getting the targets, but, uh, he's not coming down with them. Not yet, anyway. Uh, who's your next guy? Uh, my next guy is Cooper Cup. Uh, there were some concerns uh, early in the season with him. Uh, people are saying, you know, he's the number three receiver. He's coming off an ACL injury. He's not going to be consistent. He's not going to do what he was doing last year. Um, he's looking like the Rams wide receiver one. He's been consistent. Uh, he's getting red zone targets since the Rams don't really utilize a tight end. And he's looked great. Uh, was the third highest scoring receiver this week. And look for him to be even better moving on as, you know, he continues to recover from an ACL injury. Yeah, I like Cooper Cup. Uh, I moved him, uh, I moved him up substantially in my, uh, my fantasy pros rest of season rankings. He's gone up quite substantially, um, mainly because of the targets. The targets are, are growing, uh, for him. It seems like he's, he's the, he's kind of like the, the, the Edelman of the Rams, if you will. Yeah, I mean, through three games, he has 10, 9, and 12 targets. Um, I don't really say this a lot about players in fantasy specifically, but Cooper Cup might be one of those rare players that you buy high because um, you don't see many you know, slot receivers getting double-digit tar- targets a game as good red zone options. Yeah, and man. Cup is that for sure. I've moved him up to uh, uh, WR- WR12. Wide receiver one territory. Yeah, he's getting up there uh, behind Chris Godwin and Adam Thielen uh, and Bradham Cooks. Uh, the guy who is going down is, which I'm going to talk about in a bit, uh, I'll, I'll mention him, but uh, he's still ahead of him. We'll talk about that. I can leave it a mystery for now. But uh, yeah, like Cooper Cup, uh, is definitely a guy, definitely a guy on the move and uh, doing very well in that offense. Uh, he belongs um, my guy is, uh, I want to talk about Travis Kelsey. Travis Kelsey is the only one of the big three of, uh, Ertz and Kittle that made the, uh, top 10 tight ends. Continues to be, continues to be involved despite everything else that's been going on with, uh, Sammy Watkins, Michael Hardman, and, uh, Demarcus Robinson. Travis Kelsey is still getting the, the looks from, uh, Mahomes, uh, He's a steady Eddie on the on that offense. Seven receptions, eighty nine yards. Didn't get a touchdown this week, but they'll come. Um, Travis Kelsey still the uh, tight end one you want, so there's absolutely no worries in that. Off- there's a room. There's room for uh, for taking uh, Chiefs still, so there's no worries about uh, Travis Kelsey. Um, it it was a little bit worrying because he didn't get his first catch until well into the. Uh, well into the game, so um, so Patrick Mahomes wasn't relying on him early, but he always fun- he always goes back to him. Uh, he's his uh, he's his bread and butter guy, and uh, like I say, um, the other guys that are kind of a concern it was George Kittle and uh, Zach Ertz going down. Especially, I found it strange about Ertz actually because Ertz is on the Eagles, who have a lot of injuries at the moment. So I was kind of surprised that Ertz not getting, uh, well, maybe not getting better targets. He was still getting, he was still getting his share, but he wasn't getting um, the good share of it. It seemed to be all going to Aguilar, who, uh, by the way, uh, uh, made the uh, top 10. Actually, he'll be out of the top 10, but uh, just outside the top 10, Nelson Aguilar this week. But uh, thoughts on Kelsey and, uh, and his progression? Ah, in, <clears throat> you can't really be worried about Travis Kelsey. He's still got seven targets, 89 yards, and he's still a part of the best offense in the league. Um, just because he's not, you know, scoring the 100 yards and three touchdowns everybody was expecting from him in the preseason doesn't mean that we need to be worried. Kelsey's no, no. still the, the TE1 
Um, probably the obviously the most consistent tight end out there. If you have him, you're in good shape. Yeah, you are in good shape. Uh, there was the the point I was making is that he's the only one of the top three who's been consistently making the top ten. Yeah, I mean Kittle and Ertz, they're they're going to pick it up. I think Kittle is just probably get, trying to get used to to Garoppolo again, and Ertz, uh, I don't know. Um, but Ertz is like Ertz talented enough. I'm, if I have those three, I'm not worried. Everybody, you know, they're, everybody slumps sometimes. Those three are fine. Garoppolo's not going to get away throwing it to Dante Pettis and Debo Samuel the entire season. No. Uh, right. And uh, so uh, who is who's your next guy? for? Uh, uh, my next and last guy is Darren Waller, a tight end for the Raiders. He has been everything advertised in hard knocks and more. Uh, super, super consistent uh, plays and run routes, runs routes on a ton, ton of the Raiders. Um, the Raiders plays. That's what you want in tight end. You want them on the field and you want them running routes. And he does. Uh, last week was his uh, just a great game. He had 14 targets against the against the Vikings, 134 yards. And it's just he looks to be one of the most, again, consistent options because he's getting the targets and he is very obviously Derek Carr's favorite target out there. And he's going to continue being a um, good option, and he could finish the season as a top five tight end. Yeah, he he caught thirteen of those fourteen reception, fourteen targets, right? Yep. And that's uh, that's a pretty ca- good catch percentage. So, uh, and I do believe, if uh, if I'm mistaken, I could be getting him mixed up with somebody else. He was a wide receiver originally, who became a tight end. I'm Wouldn't surprise yet. me. I don't know for sure, but that would not surprise me whatsoever. So, I'm, yeah, I'm not so sure on that, and anybody can check me on that. I could be getting them mixed up with somebody else, but I think that's the case. Um, and uh, that is our last guy, and that is our uh, our lowdown on the uh, – we'll talk about a few of these other players in a bit, like uh, of, of other players that are moving on up. I think we should have – I would have been remiss if we didn't mention Greg Olson, but uh, – Greg Olson is is back, sort of. We think, and uh, definitely worth a, a pickup. He was the top, the top tight end this week. Greg Olson, top wide receiver, Mike Evans, top running back, Mark Ingram with three touchdowns. Kevin's not here to to gloat over that, so I guess that's that's pretty good. Uh, the only thing I, I mean, can he really gloat when the Ravens still lost? It's not. You know, no, no, that's, no, that's true. That's true. You can't really gloat if they, they lost, but Mark Ingram is still looking like a beast. And sadly, it looks like Justice Hill is, uh, uh, looks like he's just uh, in the background. Gus Edwards still seeing more looks than he is. So I don't know what to say about that. And Russell Wilson, numero uno quarterback, just a beast of a day, over 41 fantasy points, like ran it in twice, threw a, did a favor for fantasy teams by scoring a, a, a touchdown with, with no time remaining on the clock. I think it was a time, an untimed down and he still threw a touchdown to Will Disley, who was another, uh, who actually, Will Disley was number six on the uh, tight ends this week. Worth a pickup? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, the beginning of last season, Disley was looking like Wilson's, you know, go to, uh, red zone target and it's picked up again. Um, Disley looks healthier than he did in week one, and he's getting the targets again. Definitely, definitely a tight end pickup. Yeah, a new name on this list, of course, is uh, that I didn't mention is is Dawson Knox of the Bills. Uh, had a very good game. He was uh, seventh this week with um, where is he here? Knox, well, fifteen fantasy points, half PPR. Not bad. Good game. Yeah, good game. Jordan Akins of Houston. 20 fantasy points. So uh, he was number three. So just a few names just thrown out there. But uh, let's move on to uh, time for our panic button segment. Time to panic. Uh, I am panicking about, and I was about to mention him, I'm a little bit panicky about Devontae Adams. Um, Not getting, uh, he had a 100-yard game previously. Still doesn't have a touchdown. He's kind of going through this thing like Julio was going through before. And I actually kind of thought this would be the game that uh, Devontae Adams would break out for this year, his first big game, but it wasn't to be. Uh, I think he had something like 66 yards. Still, you know, he got 66 yards and he still produced, but not at the level what you kind of want a WR1 to produce. 
Um, thoughts on, uh, I, I even said to Adam Rank on, on Twitter, um, uh, I think you should hand me the key to the panic button for <laughs> Devontae Adams in case I need it. What do you think about this, Jono? Uh, I mean, it's tough to say panic on him. I think the, the Green Bay offense is in a weird state of flux right now, trying to get used to Matt LaFleur's uh, plays after so long with Mike McCarthy and his scheming. But Adams, his talent will will, will win out. I don't think that Aaron Rodgers is going to continue, you know, throwing it to Marquez, Valdez, Scantling um, so frequently, especially out targeting Adams 10 to 4. It's just, it's a weird decision. Um, Aaron Rodgers already come out and said that, you know, the offense needs to be better. So I think things are going to change and uh, Adams is going to get uh, more looks moving forward. Well, Adam Rodgers, I've actually moved him down to QB 15 for the mm-hmm. rest of the season. Now, uh, this is the reason why is that he's had fantasy points of this is in, in half PPR. Well, quarterbacks are, aren't involved in half PPR scoring, but they're just the same as standard, but 13, 14, and 13 fantasy points. He hasn't had a 300-yard game yet, uh, four touchdowns in that span. of uh, He's just basically had uh, 203, 209, 235 yards. Um, that's just not – that's not Aaron Rodgers to me. That's that's not – those aren't Aaron Rodgers' numbers to me. Those are uh, those are QB2 numbers to me, John. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you can't downgrade Aaron Rodgers to QB2. It's it, no, but it'll, it'll, things will pick up. It's Aaron Rodgers will work things out. Even if I start playing, calling plays himself, he'll he'll work it out. But uh, but but you're the one who brought up the Matt, the Matt Lafleur offense. I'm just wondering if this is if this is because I there has been uh, some talk that Aaron Rodgers is not happy. They're three. He's the most unhappy three and old quarterback. <laughs> uh, I think if there's a if there's ever tension between Matt LaFleur and Aaron Rodgers, you know that the Packers brass is siding with Aaron Rodgers. So one way or another, Rodgers is going to get his way. Yeah, he will. <laughs> well, we, we, we hope he will. And uh, so uh, who have you got? Uh, who are you panicking on, Jono? I am panicking on Sony Michelle. Um, this was supposed to be his week to finally, you know, come through. Uh, James White was out uh, with the birth of his child. They were facing the Jets, who, you know, the Patriots were beating up on. And at the end of the day, he rushed just nine times, 11 yards. His day was completely saved by a touchdown. But, but he, Michelle just, he's not a big part of the game plan. Uh, he was against Miami for obvious reasons, but he fumbled in that game at the end, of, at, toward the end. And of course, we know how Belichick punishes people for fumbling. Yeah. Uh, never forget uh, Stevon Ridley, who was their RB one for years. Fumbled once and then left. Was promptly kicked out of the league after Belichick was done with him. So I think through in two of the three games against non Miami opponents, Michelle's averaging one yard per carry. Um, yeah. You know he doesn't catch the ball. The Patriots' offensive line is struggling, and Rex Burkhead provides a much more versatile player. That's looked much, much better behind a weaker offensive line. And I think, Michelle, if somebody's looking to to buy him from you, then do it immediately because I don't see how it's going to get that much better with the way the Patriots offense is running right now. Yeah. He had one fantasy point against Pittsburgh, 13 fantasy points against Miami, and just like you say, seven, uh, nine carries for 11 yards. One target uh, didn't... didn't uh, didn't get anything from it, but he did score a touchdown to save his to save his bacon against the Jets. But uh, I guess you can take that touchdown as as part of your is to is a way to move on from Michelle. See, he scored a touchdown, but uh, if somebody believes you, then go ahead. If somebody believes you, yeah. But it, th- those numbers, uh, yeah, those those aren't too aren't too great. I guess I could also mention that I I almost think that. Uh, there's a bit of a problem with you know you mentioned fumbles and that that kind of came br- brought uh, Chris Carson to mind that uh, he had some fumbles on on Sunday and they brought in Procise uh, actually the one fumble that he had uh, resulted in a touchdown for the Saints the Saints he just left it on the ground and the Saints player went in it was a bit of a funny play it was one of those plays where the where the where you kind of think the ref is going to blow it dead, he didn't blow it dead, but the you know the play continued on and uh, and the Saints uh, scored a touchdown and they upheld it. It was very close, 
was very close. His knee was almost down, but uh, under review, uh, uh, the ball was clearly just coming out before his knee uh, came down, and the Saints player picked just it was just a it was just a duck sitting on the ground. So uh, naturally, a Saints player was uh, like like I say, a duck on a June bug got that uh, football and ran it in for a touchdown. Um, a little bit concerning about Chris Carson, John. Um, do you think uh, Carroll will keep him in the doghouse or? I don't think he can, not with Penny out. No, I mean, I don't think he's uh, in any danger of losing his job. Carroll's already come out and said that, um, he's already come out and said that, you know, they still believe in him and they're still going to play him. So I don't really see it as a huge issue unless he does it again um, and fumbles for a fourth straight week or a fourth time in four weeks. Yeah. Because um, he's had three straight for, already. Yeah. But for now, like you said, with the, with the depth issues and with Procise already being a very, very injury prone player. They're still going to have to lead on Carson, at least until Penny comes back. Let's take a look at the production, though. 18 fantasy points to, in week one against Cincinnati and seven against Pittsburgh and uh, and then three against uh, New Orleans. Um, he's had 15 carries in each of those games with 46 yards, 60 yards, and 53 yards. Um, these are kind of tepid fantasy points, really. You're not, he's not really the guy he paid for. So uh, I mean, he's still getting 15 carries a game, which is which is what you paid for. It's good, you know, a healthy number of carries. Uh, the game kind of got away from the Seahawks against the Saints. Uh, Russell Wilson was forced to throw, um, which is why he was the number one quarterback uh, this week. He was forced to throw, forced to finally start running again. And eh, mm. bad week for Carson, but they got the Cardinals next week. And if Penny's not playing, I expect Carson to have a big game. All right. So I got a little off, a little off track there. My other panic button guy is Baker Mayfield. Yeah, Baker Mayfield. Uh, it should be. What is it about the Browns? The Browns. They've got. I I mentioned it in my uh, my weekend preview. The the Browns are like a team. Like when you buy packed furniture, but the the assembly diagram isn't there, and you're trying to put together a thing without an assembly diagram. That's exactly what the Browns have. They've got all the weapons and everything, but it doesn't seem like Kitchens knows how to put it together. Um. I think I don't think Kitchens is a very good coach, to be honest. The way I don't know what changed between last year and this year. The offense looked good last year, and then Kitchens. I don't know what what changed, but yeah, they they don't look good. I think the the epitome of the I guess a what are you doing kind of thing is first and goal inside the five, and they ran four straight pass plays. Um, yeah, and Chubb they didn't even have there. Nick Chubb in the backfield. They just they ran empty sets on four consecutive plays from inside the five. It it doesn't make any sense. You're putting Baker in bad situations. And and Chubb was running good in that game as well. Yep. It, it doesn't make sense. The play calling needs to change. I think that they have to change up the philosophy. Um it because obviously Chubb is a good player. He can take some pressure off Baker and make things easier for everybody involved. So we'll we'll see what they do. But until something changes, you can't really play Baker in as your starter. You just can't. Yeah, he's he's worrying me because uh, numbers like twelve fantasy points, sixteen fantasy points, and eleven fantasy points. Uh, those you don't. Baker Mayfield is one of those quarterbacks you drafted sort of on the. Uh, you know, he's one of those first quarterbacks, one of the first five or six quarterbacks. Uh, you know that uh, off the board and that kind of production. I mean, one hundred ninety-five yards in his last game. Now, now, granted, the uh, game against the Jets. Now, the Jets were were terrible. But he, you know, he did get 325 yards in that game. But um, he still had an interception. But he's got five interceptions on the season. And uh, that's not very good. That's uh, Baker's not uh, not playing now. I, I think we can talk about Kitchens in the same breath. But the play calling. Uh, apparently, Kitchens says, I'm still going to do the play calling. That's what I happen to read on Twitter. But Not great. No, it's not. It's not. The, the Browns are... For some reason, the Browns like they're trying to be the Browns again. <laughs> they got to get out of this. Thank you. They they got to think that we're a new team. We're not we're not the Hugh Jackson Browns anymore. We're the you know. <laughs> so because uh, the Hugh Jackson Browns, well, we know all of it. We had we had many a joke and many a laugh last year over the Hugh Jackson Browns and uh, the Hugh Jackson Browns just awful. Anyways, uh, yeah, panicking on Baker Mayfield. You got another guy you're panicking on, Jono. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if he's, I don't know, ranked high enough or owned in enough leagues to panic on, but does Tarek Cohen count? He's still 86% owned in Yahoo. Uh, Tarek Cohen, yeah, I guess he, I guess he counts. He was, uh, uh, he did, 
I'll just take a look and see how he did uh, this week. Bad. He scored two fantasy points. Two fantasy points, that's it? Oof. Four rushes for negative two yards. Eek. Spectacular. I don't think David Montgomery did that well either. Uh, Montgomery broke off a 25-yard run in garbage time to kind of save his day. 13 carries, 67 yards, and then three catches, 14 yards. So not terrible, but the Bears need to needed to start using him more. You're facing the Redskins. They have the second worst running rushing D in the league, and David Montgomery had six carries going into the fourth quarter. That's embarrassing. That is terrible. Because uh, at one point, Cordero Patterson had more carries than he did. It's absolutely embarrassing. Oh, not Patterson. Yep. You don't want Patterson. That's like that's like Ty Montgomery getting more carries than Le'Veon Bell. It, it's such a, a weird thing, too. The Bears got inside the three on three separate occasions, and Taylor Gabriel had two touchdowns off the off of just passes from inside the three. I don't. It, I mean, it worked, but it's super frustrating uh, for Montgomery Oders to see that. I don't know if I like these Pagano Bears. These uh, Pagano. The, I mean, the, these Pagano Bears. I'm not so. I don't know. It's so hot on them. Not as good as I kind of thought. I mean, I, I actually thought Trubisky would be a little bit better than. Oh, his numbers are just ugh. Uh, after first two, I don't know how they come out today, but uh, <laughs> he's no, he's nowhere in the top twenty. Uh, I don't see his name. Uh, oh no, Ax, pardon me. I did mention him before. Actually, he's number fourteen. He did do a little bit better because he was getting some passes to uh, like Gabriel and and I'm not sure of the day that. Uh, that Alan Robinson had, but uh, what did Alan Robinson have? Do you have that? In- uh, give me one second. I just, I, I just closed the tab. <laughs> oh, sorry. Last, last I checked, he had six catches for sixty yards. Uh, give me right. two seconds here. He finished the day with six catches for sixty yards. All right. Well, it's not bad in half PPR or full PPR, you know, of course. Well, but, uh, but I mean, it's- I mean, hey, let's let's talk about Terry, uh, Terry McLaurin. Uh, <laughs> against, right. the Bears, against the Bears defense he had 6 catches for 70 yards and a touchdown uh, garbage time was friendly to him and if you're getting 70 yards and a TD against the Bears and uh, Washington's force feeding you the ball like this you're a must start next week against the Giants 100% yes yes uh, by the way I want to pass along the Chicago 31-15 final uh, over over the Redskins Redskins go to 0-3 Chicago Bears two and one. Yeah, Terry McLaurin. Yeah, we could talk about him for a little bit. He's kind of. No, a, that's all I had. I guess he's one of your moving on ups, isn't he? He definitely is. Yes. Uh, like I said, the first two weeks, they were, the Washington was obviously trying to get him the ball. Uh, this week was the real test to see uh, what he was like matchup wise. Um, of course, going against the Bears defense, still managed seventy yards and a touchdown. Um, and the schedule gets far easier from here on out. Next week they have the Giants and. He's at this point, McLaurin's a, a must start until until otherwise until proven otherwise, which of course means that he's going to bomb next week and then bomb again against New England. Well, I, I you do see these streaks come to an end though, don't we, Jono? But the volume is good. There it is. He, he it is good. the the volume is there, and Washington obviously trusts him. Uh, uh, and he's got Miami. He's got Miami in week six. So if he fails you in the next two weeks, he's got Miami in week six. So we know he's good for a bunch. Yeah, everybody looks forward to playing Miami. But DeAndre Hopkins is off to such a slow start. And you know why? You know why DeAndre Hopkins? It's because um, Deshaun Watson's getting sacked so much. Oh, getting... we knew the offensive line was going to be a problem. Yeah, it was not this that. much of a problem. He's getting sacked like, how many, like seven, six or seven times a game? I don't know how many times he's been sacked. It's it's an awful lot. It's it's And when you're getting sacked, you're not throwing the ball. You can't get the ball down deep. If you're not if you're not given time to get the ball to uh, your best receiver, he's just got no time. There's none. I can't stand Bill O'Brien. I really, I, I really don't like that coach. <laughs> he's not great, but this is probably his last chance at it, considering the talent that uh, Houston has and the assets they've poured into acquiring this team. This yeah. is his last shot. Yeah, I'm also saying that uh, I, I also will say this too. Kiki Kuti is going down. I think uh, Kenny Stills moves up. Uh, you know, we talked about briefly talked about Mike Evans. You know, um, he and Chris Godwin are so close. I don't know. I don't know if uh, Mike Evans can can keep up that. Uh, I have him at WR six rest of season, and but I, I I'm kind of wondering whether that might be a little bit optimistic because he had the breakout game against the Giants, 190 yards, 
But before that, he, was, he like had 28 and 61. And it's actually Godwin. Who do you like more, Godwin or Evans? Um, I I think I you have to trust Evans that he'll break through. Obviously, they made a point to get him the ball last week with uh, that monstrous performance, I think. Until we see it otherwise, they're pretty even. But if I was choosing, I'd probably lean on the side of Evans. <laughs> yeah, I I think I might be a little bit optimistic. But uh, OBJ, again, um, kind of worrisome for him. Although he did get 161 yards against the, Jet, the Jets, but only 56 yards against the Rams and 71 yards against Tennessee. Um, we're talking seven fantasy points, 22 and six in half PPR. It's kind of a little inconsistent. And again, well, this goes back to the Baker Mayfield thing and so forth, but we've uh, gone over that already. So what else we got, Jono? Uh, my last moving up, um, I guess, is Sterling Shepard. We talked about Daniel Jones earlier in the show. I guess in a new look Giants offense, uh, Shepard looked great. He had nine targets, 100 yards, a touchdown, and a two-point conversion. Uh, him and Jones looked like they had good good rapport. Um, he was working well all over the field. And hey, new quarterback, new new uh, you know new look wide receiver, and Shepard will you know, he's going to produce if, so long as Jones doesn't uh, doesn't fall off a cliff at some point. Uh, Shepard will be good. Yeah, I. I don't think there's any problem. I don't have any uh, problem with that. Uh, I just want to check his numbers before. Okay, he was off last week because of an injury. What was his injury? Was it a concussion or what was it? Yeah, it was the concussion. He was in the concussion program. That's right. So he was off last week. So he had 20 fantasy points with, with Daniel Jones, and he had four fantasy points with in, in, in the opening week with Eli Manning, forty-two receiving yards. Not too, uh, not too, not too great. Well, that's our uh, that's our week uh, three. What are we looking for in league three? You're the uh, waiver guy. Who are we picking up on waivers, Jono? Before we go, I mean, I think we've talked about a bunch of them already. Obviously, if you need a quarterback, Daniel Jones, Kyle Allen, uh, wide receiver, uh, sorry, running back, uh, Wayne Gallman coming in for for Saquon. I think the big. I'm going to go with one of my, the deep league one, uh, Preston Williams. I know he's a Dolphin. Don't kill me yet. Um, he got 12 targets last week from Josh Rosen. The two of them obviously had worked together a lot um, over the summer. Coming in, he has the most rapport with Rosen, and he's going to get peppered because the Dolphins are going to be behind in every game. They got to throw it to somebody, and Preston Williams looked like that guy. You know, I really, you know, I I, I don't want to, I kind of take issue every time somebody says, oh, they get the, the uh, the Dolphins are going to have to. They're going to be coming from the They're going to have to throw the ball. Uh, you know that on 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 a lot of other teams where who actually have an offense that works. <laughs> you know, like like say for instance, uh, like like a team like the Raiders, perhaps. You know, I would kind of. It's not like they're running the ball particularly well either. So no, they're not. They're not. They're not. Uh, that was yeah. They're another story. Josh Jacobs. Uh, He's kind of a moving on down guy for me. Oh, and he's just not getting enough. Uh, he's all ground. He's not getting enough. Uh, he's not getting enough uh, stuff through the air, at least for you know for for the PPR formats. So eh, he's kind of he's I, even in standard he seems a little bit shaky. But uh, um, let me throw a couple of names at you that I kind of um you know you said. Uh, uh, what was the guy that the, the Dolphins you just mentioned now? Um, Preston Williams. Preston Williams. The other guy that uh, the, the, this guy's on the Colts. I want to get your your thoughts on Dion Kane and Paris Campbell. These these two guys. Uh, they intrigue me. These two, uh, especially if if T Y Hilton is T Y Hilton. I just got to check his status at the moment. He is. Um, uh, He's he exited the game with his quad with a quad injury. So if he's out, um, should we should we pick up Paris Campbell or Dion Kane or what should we do if Hilton's out? Uh, who's who's the pickup? I think at the moment both of them are very very risky pickups. You can't really trust either of them until we know how the targets are going to kind of shake out. Right. But of the two, uh, I would prefer Paris Campbell. He was the one getting more, I guess, talk during during the off season. Uh, mm-hmm. He was learning. The playbook really well, according to according to coaches, and he did have a touchdown catch in week two. Uh, <laughs> he's he was playing, uh, you know, decent amount, I guess, not not a whole lot, but when Hilton was healthy, I think of the two, Campbell's Campbell's the option. 
Right. So uh, he's so he's the next up man. So is he a guy that we should? Is, so he's the guy we should pick up uh, on for Wednesday morning. If you're in a deeper league, uh, yes, I think Campbell's pro- Campbell's a deep op- a good option if you're in a deeper league. But I think in sh- like ten team or shallower leagues, um, he's not really somebody you should maybe a flyer, but not not a priority pickup in shallower leagues, not yet. Right, but but if uh, of course if if T Y Hilton is out, somebody's got to catch the ball, right? Yeah, Jack Doyle. Jack Doyle. <laughs> what the tight end? The tight end duo. Yes, pick one of them up. Tight end, Jack Doyle. <laughs> yeah, because I got I because I'm 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 struggling to look as after Par- after uh, after Paris Hilton. <laughs> I got all this, I talk about <laughs> Paris Campbell, <laughs> Paris Paris Hilton. Uh, yeah, uh, after uh, Par- Paris. Uh, Campbell, uh, I mean, pardon me. After T. Y. Hilton, <laughs> no, I got, I got, I got this picture of Paris Hilton in my head now. It's like, you know, it's got to get my mind back on football. Uh, <laughs> T. Y. Hilton, after T. Y. Hilton, so it seems like it's a long drop for the next wide receiver on the team. Uh, I mean, the, the next guy was supposed to be Devin Funchess, and he's just not, he's not healthy. He broke his collarbone, so he's out. Yeah. Uh, Funches would have been a good, uh, you know, uh, the priority pickup, but we have no idea if Campbell or Kane can, can consistently produce as, you know, a number one or two wide receiver. So that's the only reason I'm kind of hesitant. But of course, if you're in a deeper league, like, and there's no other options, then of course, yeah, go for it. Yeah. So I guess I'll pick up Paris Hilton. Paris. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, Paris Hilton's a, definitely a priority pickup. <laughs> Paris Campbell, folks. Sorry for the levity, but uh, it's kind of funny how that works. But anyway, it's one of the things when we do in the podcast. Well, Jono, been a been a smash. I uh, want to thank. Uh, hopefully, uh, Kevin Hall will be back with us next week uh, to uh, for for week four because uh, this is our for pardon me to uh, for week five. Gee, yeah, the weeks are flying by, aren't they, Jono? Um, so hopefully, Kevin will be back with us next week. Uh, make sure you check out the uh, Fantasy Six Pack Hour with Joe Bond, plus the other numerous podcasts that are, that are coming out. I don't know if there's good hope. We've got three or four podcasts at the site uh, with different people. Joe does one on the, on Sunday. He's, he's, he's doing a whole bunch of Milo's potting. So uh, be sure to uh, check out the Fantasy Six Pack Hour. That's his main uh, one that's on, on Fridays with uh, AJ Applegarth and be sure to also check out the rest of the uh, articles including Jono's uh, waiver wire pickups tomorrow to find out uh, the details on all these players that we talked about on the show tonight so uh, for Jonathan Chan I'm Richard Seville be sure to join us next week on the Fantasy Edge take care everybody and good luck <laughs>